Scotty, thanks for coming on the show. Hey, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Now you've been uh, you've been lost in space for a long time. <laughs> you told me you're going to start with <laughs> some off the wall comments. I didn't, I didn't know that they'd happen immediately. I, I have been. I've been lost in space for probably thirty years now. Yeah, and uh, you've you've actually made a full time living off of off of space. Yeah. Which yes. is which is rare. There's not that many people that are, have actually done that can actually claim that their life has been spent uh, dealing with with uh, space businesses. I think I've been very fortunate. Yeah, tell us tell us a little bit about how you got started and what that um, you know, kind of um, unusual product was that you came up with. Um. It actually goes back even even earlier than when I got started in that my father was a professor of horticulture, and he ended up leaning his career into uh, growing plants in space. He was the first one to grow potatoes in space. Okay. So I had this sense that you didn't have to be rocket science to end up, you know, being in space. You could start from a lot of different places. Um, chemical engineer was working in nuclear weapons and uh, ended up uh, just knowing I wanted to be an entrepreneur entrepreneur of sorts, I left big business with another fellow and started making uh, water, new water heaters for homes. Okay. And an invention came from that that was like a magic trick. And uh, we knew there was going to be another industry for it. So I, it, and I, I brought it along with me. Um, this, is, this is the device. It's basically made from hardware store parts. And it's a tube of copper. It's filled with wax. When it heats up, the wax melts. It expands 15%. This little rod extends very slowly, Okay. but it can lift a small child. It, it, this can push 40 pounds over two inches. Oh, wow. And you'd, you'd see this work and you'd get this sense of there's got to be a use for it. Yeah. I ended up calling different industries and I did just call into NASA and say, you know, I've got this really unusual device. Maybe it could be used in spacecraft to... When the spacecraft gets hot, you could open up something to cool it off okay. automatically. They said, that's, you know, that's wonderful, but that's not what we need. We're going to Saturn with Cassini, and we have been using explosives to open telescope covers. And that's very expensive because the telescope then needs to handle an explosive. So uh, for some perspective, what year was that? This was 1980. 87, 1987. Okay. Challenger had just blown up about three years before. Ah, yes. And uh, NASA was kind of, what are we going to do next? But the interplanetary missions were solid, and that's what I was involved in with Cassini. Okay. And so your device then made it onto the Cassini uh, spacecraft. Yep. And uh, no, was, that, uh, was that based out of Boulder, most of the research on that? It was... Um, yeah, I've, I'd been living in Boulder because I wanted to ski and be an engineer, and that was a great place to do it. Mork and Mindy had just been on TV, and it you know, okay. sounded great. So I was in Boulder, and uh, yeah, that's where everything kind of happened, in a garage in Boulder is where we got started. Okay, so no ski slopes on Mars or the moon yet, so <laughs> yeah, quite. something local. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was kind of it. Yeah, and, uh, and then how did you go about pricing this thing? Well, um. The the interesting thing, and you know, just prior to that, is I had an, a picture of this thing opening, you know, the windows, so to speak. But NASA actually, you know, it said put a heater on it, and okay. you put a heater on it, and then we'll open these covers. What I didn't realize is that we were saving them maybe a hundred thousand dollars every time they used one of these because the telescope didn't need to be qualified for that. Okay, so we called them up and called up NASA when we got the first order and said, how much should we charge? And they said, oh, about $5,000. Okay. So that seemed like far more money than we should be asking for. Okay. But if NASA says. Okay. So we, uh, the first order for these, for three of them, uh, we charged $15,187 because we figured with those significant digits, they'd figure we'd done a very accurate costing. Okay. And we weren't going to make too much money. Okay. So that was what these started costing just from that arbitrary kind of arbitrary number. And that was the price that you put on them in McGuckin's hardware too. <laughs> we didn't tell McGuckin's that. We went and bought our little car, our uh, <laughs> copper tubes for $7 and then filled them with wax and sold them for $5,000. That's what it boiled down to. 
But you know, the interesting thing, Tom, is uh, we found out we left a lot of money on the table. And those yeah. those devices now, there's probably oh, 5,000 of them that have been used on spacecraft. Okay. And they now sell for a little over $20,000. Wow. Yeah. And we're still saving NASA a lot of money. Yeah. Well, that's terrific. Um, this is one of those uh, unusual success stories. Then tell, uh, tell us how the company evolved from there. We... Um, we were r ridiculously innocent and naive, and that worked okay. in our advantage. Okay. Uh, NASA would come back, or space companies, and say, well, if you make that little device, could you maybe make the cover for the telescope? And just the fact that they were asking us let us believe that we could. Okay. And then we'd say, sure, we'll, we'll make a cover for you. But then you're committed. You right, know, right. It, as an entrepreneur, we're like, okay, we have got to figure out how to do this. And we did. And then they came to us and said, how about a docking system? Yeah, okay. And we did. Okay. And then large deployables the size of a football field. And um, we just kept marching up the ladder of more complexity just from a belief that, well, if they're asking us, then we must be able to. And then we pulled it off. It was surprising yeah. to us. Well, if they asked you, you felt they had faith in you. Yeah. And... and um, yeah, that seemed like a logical relationship then to just continue to build on. Um, and then uh, how how many people did you get to? How big a company did this evolve into? We um, we started with me and Daryl in a garage. And we got to about 50 people. We, started, we got to 50. And we realized that there's only so much honestly just so much wax you can put on a spacecraft i mean i mean we, we'd saturated the market with wax okay and so we went and found a motor company that made like you know motors that you and i are familiar with and yeah. they sold to us and once we had a technology that wasn't limited motors can do anything then right. then it exploded for us everybody came to us how oh. and we became victims of our own success almost. We took everything on. We were growing at 40% a year. Uh, we grew to about 150 people, uh, became one of the world's leading suppliers of motors and spacecraft. Wow. You know, a weird thing for some ski bum chemical engineer to 15 years later right. in that position. And then we, then we ended up selling uh, to what became Sierra Nevada Corporation. Okay. And we were the core of 150 people that then grew to become what's now a, a multi-thousand person company. Okay. Making uh, replacements for the space shuttle. A very cool thing called Dream Chaser, far beyond anything I could right. conceive of or manage, <laughs> but I am very proud of being part of the you know start of it. Hello, this is Trent Fowler, co-host of the Futurati Podcast. One of the most common pieces of marketing advice I've come across is to know your audience and give them what they want. One difficulty in podcasting is that it's actually pretty hard to do this. None of the major platforms give us any way to reach out to you, our listeners, to find out what you enjoy about the Futurati podcast and what you'd like to see done differently. So we've decided to record this commercial and ask you directly to reach out to us. Head over to futuratipodcast.com, go to the contact page, and drop us a line. Tell us about your favorite and least favorite episodes, what you'd like to see us cover in the future, and anything else you want us to know. We produce this show for you, and we want your advice so we can make it even better. Thank you. Well, this, this I think, um, kind of paints an interesting picture of what lots of entrepreneurs, uh, they start off with something that's relatively manageable and interesting, and, Very and then point. it evolves from there. Yeah. And uh, it, it starts in a place that you just never imagined you would ever start from. Um, that's very true. And so... After selling out to Sierra Nevada, um, then what did you do? You went on a 400-day cruise around the world four times? <laughs> no, I, 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 I didn't go down that path of buying the house in Maui and uh, okay. the Ferrari or any of that stuff. I, I, I was still, you know, fascinated by space. And so uh, with the help of uh, Jared Polis, actually, okay. who, was, who was then a new congressman, Okay. He helped us get funding and in partnership with Sierra Nevada and University of Colorado. And uh, Mark Sarangelo, a, a visionary who was the one that actually bought, you know, our company, 
uh, we started eSpace, the Center for Space Entrepreneurship. And with a couple million dollars, we then helped other companies follow on the same path. Okay. So we would get the mentorship in space and we'd make connections to them. And we, we incubated a half dozen companies. Okay. Uh, one of which just recently sold for, um, I think, pretty much a third of a billion dollars. Wow. So we gave them the first 20K. Okay. And, uh, and a handful of wax. And a handful of wax and, <laughs> and a little, hey, you know, go for it sign. Uh, and they, uh, they did well. So super proud of being able to catalyze in Colorado some of those companies. Okay. Is, and so is that what you're still doing today? Uh, you're looking for those startups? Interestingly enough, I am after a, a, a interesting little, I, it'll pivot into, into dis, stopping distracted driving. Okay. So uh, as an entrepreneur, you end up looking for big problems to solve. Right, right. And I went to visit a vice president of a company I was going to maybe work for and went through an intersection and there was glass all over the intersection. Ah. Somebody must have had an accident. I went in to see the fellow, Dave Super, the VP of engineering, and they said, Dave's not here. He was just killed in that intersection. Oh, wow. And um, two hours ago by a texting driver. So that oh, was man. 2008, and then that boosh, created, this is going to be a big deal, and let's find the solution for it. Okay. Started working with Verizon, Sprint, American Family Insurance, uh, some telcos in Australia. Raised a lot of money down in Australia for this solution. Okay. Did that for about 13 years, 12 years. And then uh, as that moved on to the next level, circled back to your point. Okay. Into space and uh, working and helping other space entrepreneurs and space companies. Okay. It's just kind of down this path, you know, that so other people can have that same kind of experience. Okay. So I am, I'm back. Okay. I'm back from, you know, 30 years ago, I'm back doing the same darn thing I was doing back then. <laughs> Just when you tried to get out, it pulled yeah, you back. When I tried to go to Maui and I tried to buy the Ferrari, now here I am again, you know, doing the same old stuff. Yeah, that's uh, that's absolutely fascinating. So uh, you are you're actively looking for space entrepreneurs now? In Colorado, um, I end up, people know about Starsis. You know, okay. People know the story. It's a good, I mean, it's a great story. It's a tube of wax that became a space company. And uh, so as, as companies go through certain phases of growth, the network will connect them to me okay. saying, hey, we're having trouble with how we do programs uh, uh, for a fixed price, or where do we get investment money, or how does a CEO handle the transitions as it goes from 10 people to 100 people. And so I'll come in and you know, say, well, you know, here's the mistakes I made that you don't need to make, yeah. and I help them out. So I, I usually... People find me rather than me going out and looking for them. Okay. Okay. Um, now, as, as you've been thinking through uh, the type of space companies that are um, kind of highest priority and some of those that are nice to have, uh, how, how's your thinking evolved on that? I, I'm going to, I'm going to paraphrase what I think you're saying in there, which is, Space is exploding now. You know, it's it's yeah. it's a hot topic. Elon Musk has been huge in that, um, and so now there's entrepreneurial space companies springing up everywhere. It's kind of a big deal. There really wasn't too much of that back in the day. They there's a lot of sizzle around it. Uh, right, right. You know, like oh gosh, we can go back to uh, you know Bitcoin. We can go to cannabis. Um, you can go all the way back to Holland with tulips. Okay. You know, where all of a sudden there's a lot of excitement about here's a way to make a fortune. With that comes ponderance of of things, some of which are going to make it yeah. and some of which aren't. Right. And it can be difficult to separate the wheat from the chaff, so to speak. Right. And uh, as as one of the leading space financiers said about a year ago to a friend of mine, there's the entrepreneurial opportunities that are real and the ones that aren't. Okay. And it's kind of like a one or a zero. Okay. So let's say I want to uh, build a, a gambling parlor in space yes. that, um, that uses uh, zero gravity roulette wheels or, I don't know, something, something very novel. No, no, I got it. No, Tom, I got it. <laughs> Three-dimensional roulette. 
because we're in we're you were in you know zero g it can go in all kinds of directions we're not limited to a circle we're going to make a fortune don't yeah. tell us oh wait don't tell a soul <laughs> yeah but to your point I'm sorry. yeah uh so how much can i count on raising with that uh there i i don't i don't think that one's going to go well for you okay um there's not enough sizzle to it okay but there are things that are like a like a hotel in space. So I'm going to run this out just for a bit, if that's okay. Yeah. But we'll run this out. There are probably, um, I don't know, uh, 100,000 people in the world that would pay a million dollars to spend a week in yeah. a hotel in space. That's a pretty big market. Right. And so you can start to argue, let's see, if we did a hotel in space, we could, you know, here's the price it would cost to build it. Here's the price it would cost to get people up to it. At the end of the day, if you really used a sharp pencil, you'd come to the conclusion of great idea, but two things will kill it. The cost of assembly of something that can handle that many people in space in a way that worked in a hotel. Okay. You're, you're talking multiple billions. Yeah. Just, just, you know, making stuff up. And this is an interesting one. The cost to accelerate a human body to 17,000 miles an hour is expensive. Okay. So it's not getting up to 200 miles. That's not that hard. But you've got to get going 17,000 miles an hour in order to stay in orbit. And that takes a lot of fuel. And that is extraordinarily expensive. Okay. So another way of saying it is you can build the Ritz-Carlton, but if you do it in a place that costs $100,000 to get to, you're not going to get as many people. Okay. But you could probably start making a business case around hotel and space and have it look kind of reasonable. It might work. Okay. I'm not going to put money into that. I need something that looks like there is no possible way I'm not going to lose money. Okay. And then it maybe has a chance of making money. That's just, you know, my point of view. Okay. Um, so what's, what's another example of uh, a business in space, uh, like a manufacturing station in space, um, like a space laboratory? There's always people wanting to do space research. Yep. Um, um, I'm just trying to build, I'll, I'll, I'll build on that a bit. Okay. Um, one of the top candidates right now for manufacturing in space is you're, you're in space, you have zero gravity, which allows crystal growth in a different way. Okay. So there actually are things from zero G that just cannot be done on earth. And what people are positing is the idea that you can make a fiber optics of a clarity that's unmatched. Uh, by doing it in zero gravity because of the nature of how crystals form. And yeah. if you have a, a, a liquid glass, anything it touches starts the crystallization process and the crystals are a certain size. If it doesn't touch anything, the yeah. crystals can be much, much larger. Yeah. So there is conceptually uh, one of the big potential uses for space manufacturing is, is making very, very good um, fiber optics. Okay. And that's one of the best business cases out there that people are talking about, making it worth going up there and coming back again. So uh, I've actually spent a lot of time thinking about this idea of being first. And there's there's lots of people who want to be first around something. And so the space is like virgin territory. There's everybody that wants yeah. to be first doing this or first doing that. And I'm going to give you a really uh, probably crazy example yeah. here but somebody's going to have the first child in space. And, um, uh, That's interesting. Uh, yeah. yeah. And so if, if a child is born in a zero gravity environment, what happens to that kid? And, uh, do, do we have any clue at this point? <laughs> so I'm going to make something up, but that every once in a while, when somebody brings up a new concept, this is weird, but I get goosebumps. Okay. And I've, I've learned over the past 30 years that it means something. Okay. It, it means that there's something, you know, there to what right. I brought up. Uh, but just making this up on the spot, uh, in, in the, the embryo in the amniotic fluid is for all practical purposes weightless. It's okay. no different than why they put astronauts underwater in order to simulate waste, weight, weightlessness. Right. So the first order thinking about that is that the fetus development is going to be unchanged. Okay. Now, having said that, there's probably second order things that, that who would have thought come into play. 
Yeah. And uh, now, though, to your point, now that baby is not dealing with gravity after it's born. It has no sense of up or down. All those, and I'm just kind of con, you know contriving this, but all those things that are probably a part of the learning that the instant the baby comes out, they start doing. A whole bunch of those are gone. Okay. And so to your point, there might be a very, very different sort of experience of what, what happens with baby development. Right. So right. Yeah, it's interesting. And then, yeah, then you think about, well, if that baby ever ends up on Earth, can it survive? Because suddenly the, you got gravity to deal with and uh, it's way different than any artificial gravity in space or um, the the atmosphere is different. Uh, lot, lots of interesting questions surrounding that. It'd be extraordinarily hostile. <laughs> I mean, to, I mean right. that in a serious sense of hostile environment. Hostile environment, it'd be like a crushing environment that you, it'd be hard to imagine somebody experiencing for the first time as a child. Right, right. Um, so, huh. yeah, yeah. Is is if somebody tried that, would you be accused of child abuse or something? I don't know. There, there would, I'm sure, be <laughs> seriously a lot of ethical questions, a lot of ethical questions about right. how you'd, uh, you know, get the okay to do an experiment like that. But you are you are bringing up an interesting. I mean, on another thought, just riffing on that a bit. We thought this would be used for one thing, and yeah. it ended up being nothing we could imagine, you know, putting right, meters on right. it. We could probably imagine that five years from now, there's going to be a who would have thought moment that that is the thing that really was space manufacturing. Right. Who would have thought this was it? Or or space business. Some crazy wild uh, comment here or there that led somebody else to think it's way off the wall. Yeah. Okay. Like Crocs. Who would have thought those foam rubber shoes? <laughs> I digress. Um, but it, it's a really good question of that that other one of not only who's first, but you know the who would have thoughts. Right. That would that would come from this. Right. Right. Um, so you've you've taken all of everything you've learned and put it into a, a book, and. Uh, and so tell us a little bit about what your your goal in writing this book was and where you hope to go with it. A, a, a mentor of mine uh, once said everybody should write a book. And, and you know this. Of course yeah. you know this. Not because it'll ever necessarily get published, but there's something about putting what's here to here. Right. It crystallizes it and memorializes it. So I, uh, what, what the manuscript is, what the book is, is From the Garage to Mars, Adventures of a Space Entrepreneur. And okay. so it's, it's a good story, you know, starting from this, a uh, ski bum that creates a space company and, you know, right. we had 50 motors driving around the Mars surface Yeah, and my kids' names are etched on those motors. <laughs> Na NASA doesn't know that, you know, we, we did it kind of surreptitiously. <laughs> um, it's a good story. And what you realize when you put that down is you also realize the themes that go through it that are trans transferable right that that you know have broad application and the two of them and, and there's really two major themes all the way through um one of them is is the power of fun ah. and another way of saying it is the power of the f word okay um starsis was built on a culture within the company of play and fun okay we we did all kinds of things that were way out of the box in terms of fun. Okay. And um, we don't have time to go into too much here, uh, but I will, I, I will actually. Can I go into one? We have oh, sure. That? Sure. So we are going to come back to this, but what happened, I'm going to kind of cut to the, the chase in the story, is uh, we probably had more fun than anybody else in the space biz. Okay. I, I think that's probably pretty close to true. We also had 3,000 mechanisms that flew on spacecraft with no failures, and that's unprecedented. And those two things are actually pretty well linked. Uh -huh. um, so one of, the, one of the themes through the book and the reason for writing is to try to inculcate into corporate culture the idea that, you know, it, what's the opposite of this? That's why it's called work. It's not supposed to be fun. <laughs> no, you know, I think of it a little differently. 
Are you enjoying this episode of the Futurati Podcast? If so, please like it, give the show a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts, and share it with your friends. By far, the best way to help us grow is to spread the word on social media, which will expose our content to more people and help us continue to bring you interviews with world-leading experts in AI, quantum computing, cryptocurrencies, and so much more. Thank you in advance. Yeah, so that's one of the things, the themes I was using uh, for a long time uh, I was trying to bring fun back into the future. Because when I was a kid growing up, yeah. I would see all of the covers of Popular Science Magazine. I'd see the things coming out of Bell Labs. Just everything about the future seemed just magical and amazing. Yeah. And I couldn't wait for it to happen. And I, I, I wanted to somehow bring that back again because Hollywood has done a real hatchet job on turning everything, every science fiction movie into a dystopian uh, murder fest or something. And very good te- point. Technology, very good point. Yeah. technology is always the bad guy. And mm-hmm. uh, and then by the time you're done watching, you say, oh, hell no. I don't ever want to, I don't know, but you want to go, I don't want tomorrow to show up because if you ask people today what they think about the future, it's all about shortages and disasters and disease and um, uh, global warming, yep. just everything that could possibly go wrong is going to go wrong like tomorrow. And uh, so I wanted to bring fun back into it and because the this dystopian look at the future has, has got to go. <laughs> that is interesting. Um, just building on what you're saying, you know, we go back to you and I, uh, Star Trek, of course, which right. still, oh my gosh, you know, yeah. where no man has gone before, yeah, you know, that, that, the wonder, the fun, the wonder. Right. Um, 2001 Space Odyssey also had that sort of beautiful view of the future. Right, right. And that is not uh, the things that I've been watching on Netflix during COVID. <laughs> not at all. Yeah. I... My, the hopeful thought is it will have a natural cycle, you know, yeah. that it will come back, that people get tired of that and looking for something different. Yeah. Right. But I like that, you know, bring the fun back. I like right. that a lot. <laughs> yeah. I, I just, uh, every, every time you go, I, I would go to Blockbuster Video and I'd try to look for science fi- good science fiction movies. And it was always in the horror section. And, uh, and why is that? Um, Oh, you, you know what? The thing that flipped the flipped it for us was Blade Runner. If okay. you remember Blade Runner, every everything, everything in the future up till that point was, um, a, a, you know, a utopian space future. Okay, and I think that's maybe where it pivoted. So, we blame Philip K. Dick for that. Yeah, it was it was that Harrison Ford in that one. Yeah, Harrison Ford was in the first one and the second one for that matter. Yeah, but um, yeah, that. That was actually, the movie came out two months after Philip K. Dick died. Uh, he was, he wrote all these, shame. these yeah. famous uh, science fiction, the screens, screenplay for science fiction movies back in the 1950s. And um, they, they all turned into the biggest ones, Total Recall. Uh, I did not know that. The, the movie Next with yep. uh, her, um, Nicolas Cage and then A.I., um, it came out the Tom Cruise movie. Um, everything that almost all of these that we thought um, were, were it really ingenious, they came out of Philip K. Dick's uh, story library. And even today, there's still a bunch of people going back re- reviewing his old stories to see if there's, see if something. there's something they missed in there that yeah. they could uh, turn into a screenplay. <laughs> well, then you and I grew up with Heinlein and Arthur C. Clarke. Oh, yeah. It was a utopian view of the future. Right, right. You know, yeah, they had some twists and turns of the Foundation Trilogy, but at the end of the day, you know, space was a good, fun thing. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to, can I circle back to something that I just oh, sure. frogged over because of this, the fun thing? Um, one of the things that became legendary within the company and the industry is we spent a lot of time in our company, Starsis, on the Vomit Comet. Okay. Vomit Comet is a, you know, plane that flies out over the Gulf and goes about 40 times like this. Right. And you get about 25 seconds of weightlessness. Right. So we made it a, a company mission to get as many people in our company in that because okay. this is close to being 
an astronaut as any of us were going to get. Right, right. And they would give you time to play. You could bring yo-yos and some okay. bottles. Yeah. And we'd have a, people would just pick a name out of a hat to go to the vomit comet when once okay. we had a flight. So if you were the front, at the front desk, you had as much chance as the vice president. Ah. Uh-huh. But then to have everybody get involved in it, um, we had what's called the vomit pool. <laughs> and it's called the vomit comet because when you do this 40 times, about two thirds of the people throw up. It's mm-hmm. just the deal. You get, you know, that's the deal. So we would every, each put five bucks in a, in a, in a bucket. Okay. And we'd have like March Madness. You'd have a matrix. I think, I think Tom's going to throw up on Tuesday and Thursday. I think Marianne's <laughs> going to throw up on Friday and, and you'd fill out your matrix and then they'd report in and say who threw up on that day <laughs> and whoever got the most X's right got 500 bucks. Okay. So, um, you know, those, those were the kind of things that we did to sort of, you know, make it fun. <laughs> All right. Uh, that's a strange bit of fun, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were a little edgy with that kind of stuff, but anyways. Yeah. Um, so if you um, if you're looking over the landscape of 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 opportunity in space right now, um, as as AI comes to the forefront, how does that open up doors that were never open in the past? And um, is are, are we I. My my sense is is that uh, AI is going to make it so that a lot of work can get done with fewer people. Yes, and but at the same time, it opens the door for tons more startups. And so I just see this startup explosion happening in the background. And so overall, we're going to be employing far more people than ever before in history. And in fact, we probably won't have enough people for all the jobs that we get get created which seems to be happening right now. Uh, yeah. But it's mainly in the restaurant industry. <laughs> oh, don't forget DoorDash and oh, getting yeah. the food to your to your house. But yeah, I, I agree with you. Yeah. And so um, so what? How, how in your mind does AI open the door for future space businesses? I, th- I think I, that's a good question because I think it's ultimately going to change the paradigm about space exploration, uh, the paradigm in the 70s and into actually into the 80s strongly was you can't not have humans on the places we explore. Okay. Yeah, it costs 10 times as much, but what right. are you ever going to get from a robot right. compared to having somebody that can pick something up and make decisions? And right. The, the key there, it was always about the decisions made in the moment. Ah. Uh. So that was the argument as to why we should spend, I'm going to make up some numbers here, $100 billion going to Mars rather than have robots go to Mars. Okay. Much harder argument with AI. Okay. Because now you're starting to realize that you have the ability to go, oh, wait a minute, that looked like a trilobite. Um, I should look at that a little closer, you know, on your Mars rock. Yeah. Yeah. And make that a real-time, instantaneous decision, probably quicker than you or I could make because of an infinite body of knowledge that's brought to bear on what you're seeing and the AI heuristics that come into that. Okay. Okay, well, now let's relook at $100 billion to go to Mars. Well, maybe not. Now you've got the decision-making happening on Mars so that you can bring human-esque intelligence but then bring virtual reality into it, which we all are very familiar with now with 3D goggles and, and tactile suits where you can feel what's going on and that technology's here. You start getting to the point of why would we send people all the way out to Saturn? Yeah. Uh, wouldn't it be easier to yeah, just do this kind of stuff? <laughs> you still have latency. Yeah. In fact, well, it takes a while. But anyways, yeah, that, there's there's one way that I think it might change things. Yeah, yeah. So lately, I've I've spent a lot of time trying to differentiate AI from the human experience. Yeah, and, and um, you know when uh, I I, have, I get stomach aches, I get a tooth yeah. toothache, I get sore legs from going out biking, or 
Um, the, my relationship with this person I value very highly, but my relationship with this person over here I don't value as highly. And so we, we create these emotional ties with everything around us, and AI doesn't have the ability to do that. And so when we, when we think in terms of um, uh, how AI goes about assessing things and evaluating things, it's, it's radically different than the way we as humans would experience it. That's, well, just the, just the word experience yeah. is almost something that it's very hard to picture being a part of the AI vocabula vocabulary. Yeah. The feel of it, the emotion of it, the, the connection with it. Yeah. Uh, AI never gets an aha moment. <laughs> <laughs> that, it, that, well, it never, AI never cries. Yeah. AI, AI never, um, N never has an epiphany. Uh, no, no, it doesn't, does it? <laughs> yeah. Huh. Yeah. So. What you're bringing, what you're doing is you're, you're actually bringing two things to bear in the conversation, which are interesting. One is the, you know, the idea of inspiration. It doesn't have it. It doesn't have inspiration. Right. Right. That, that millisecond where all of a sudden all the tumblers go into place yeah. and, and all of a sudden, aha, right. to your point. So it doesn't have that, but it also doesn't have this extraordinary human element of empathy and human yeah. connection. And this almost to me, magical. Yeah. What, what to me, what defines humanity is empathy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I don't think 20 years from now we'll be saying, Oh, we came up with a robot that has empathy. Right. See, I, I've always talked about uh, the value of having an epiphany in that the, every, every startup business has got started with an epiphany. Yeah. Every new product that gets created gets created with epiphany. So we're actually um, way better off having more epiphanies than ever before. And so I, I think of AI as a tool yeah. to, help, to help amplify our experience, to help amplify our capabilities. And, uh, uh, but it doesn't replace us. It works with us. Well, well, building on that, epiphanies seem to come from connection of disparate information in a way that things align and then the aha moment happens, combining this from way over here from way over there. And AI would give us a much larger data set to work from yeah. To be able to maybe make those connections. Right, right. And I mean, it's a hopeful thought for me that it'll always be the humans that are the ones that have the epiphanies. Right. Although you could argue, ah, it's just crunching numbers and, you know, you crunch enough numbers and an epiphany <laughs> will happen. <laughs> I like your idea, though, better. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, ju I just think that uh, uh, AI creativity is vastly different than human creativity. And, um, and, and so how you differentiate the two, I think is, is super important. Well, the, there's an analogy to this with, um, chess playing computers because, you know, back in the sixties and seventies, when they started playing chess, the computers just overpowered it. They just did a, you know, a million calculations right, to right. get from here to there. And, um, that wasn't replicating the intuitive Kasparov kind of aha, of here's what I need to do. Right. And I, I think they have caught up with humans, but probably just from dumb number crunching rather than well, right. replicating intuition. Right, right. I mean, the AI does not wake up in the morning with a passion for playing basketball. <laughs> 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 or, uh, that, that's probably a bad e example but <laughs> well um, no in a way no in a way no um because some of those things that are the craziest things happen from those waking up in the morning and saying uh, i'm you know personally i'm gonna go down this path yeah um, yeah um yeah. yeah a lot a lot of times i i have <laughs> these these uh these epiphanies in the middle of the night and the way the way i think about them is they're um they're they become an obligation uh you either need to do something with your epiphany 
or you need to uh, essentially kill it or let it go, or uh, uh, because because you have this this if this is one that where you you kind of your mind is working all night trying to put pieces together and figure out how it's all going to happen and work. Yeah. And some of those are the uh, kind of the the full blown master epiphanies that that just occupy your entire brain but then you wake up in the morning and says oh crap i got to do something with this or i i don't know do i even have time to think about this anymore yeah and uh but it but it places an obligation on you that you never saw coming so the the counterpoint to that since we all don't have the bandwidth to run out the epiphanies that we have um, and it does a disservice to try to run them all out. So if right. you have a thousand clever things you thought of in the morning, you're yeah. going to get none of them out. There's, right. There has to be sort of a sorting through to, and it's still an obligation. It's an obligation to kind of uh, rank and, you know, prioritize your, to, to choose the ones that are the one that you're going to lean into and say, all right, here we go. Yeah, and, and it's amazing how, um, with all the options that we might have today, um, most people don't know how to do any of them. Uh, don't know how to bring this to life. Don't know how to uh, expand on it. And I, my contention is, is that of all the major problems we have in the world today, all of them have been solved a million times over by people who have no clue what to do, what with, to that do with that solution. <laughs> And who say, oh, somebody must have thought of this. Yeah. Um, yeah. When, no. Yeah. <laughs> or, or somebody might have yeah. you know, 150 years ago, but they never wrote it down. Right. Or um, they, they didn't, what, what are you supposed to do with it? You post it online, you put it on social media, well, then yeah. somebody will steal it. Do you, do you patent it? Uh, yeah. That's, that's a long haul. Uh, um, yeah. Or do you trademark it or copyright it or somehow try to protect it? Do you start a business out, out of it? Do you, um, do you give it to a friend that might know how to, to, to do something capitalize it. on it? Yeah. Um, yeah. You, you think through that whole list of options and very likely you'll come up with not uh, very good answers. Triggers two thoughts. Um, one, it's very practical that I spend time with pe people that want to be entrepreneurs. Right. And it's the one piece of advice that I kind of give them all, which is socialize, socialize, socialize. Okay. Describe it to people and look for their reaction. And if the reaction is, good idea, Tom, you know, that, that probably is a good idea. <laughs> That's different then. Holy smokes. Yeah. If you go with that, let me invest. Okay. Or, I, he, oh my God. Yeah. If you socialize across a group of friends and people in the area and you get a universal response. Yeah. Okay. That's one of them you kind of have to consider putting to the top of the list. Okay. And it, to your point, it's, it's about killing the stuff that's distracting but finding the gold, the, the diamond in the rough, and then yeah. making it so. Do you need a dynamic and knowledgeable speaker for an event? Thomas Fry and me, Trent Fowler, are both seasoned keynote speakers, able to converse on a wide array of topics to audiences of all sizes and skill levels. Go to the contact page at futuratipodcast.com to book Thomas or myself today and let us apply our years of experience in public speaking to make your event a smashing success. So when I'm um, giving a presentation and I'm uh, testing out new material, I, I try it on different people. Yeah. And what I, what I find is that as I explain it oh, five, six, ten times, I get much better at explaining yes. it. Is and very and good sudden, yeah. suddenly I can explain it in sound bites rather yep. than this uh, 42 sentences that I strung together and don't really make much sense. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and and then once you're able to to kind of crystallize it in this this right um, combination of words, then then it um, uh, I don't know it becomes um, uh, much more resilient and manageable and and people um, gravitate towards it and uh, so then I I get a good sense as to whether I'm on the right track or not. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, but that everything ha- requires a test case. Um, see, early early on, before I started the Da Vinci Institute, yeah. I, um, uh, you know, I had this idea. I wanted to be the Thomas Edison like inventor, mm-hmm. and boy, that's a rough lifestyle. And and then um, mm. and I had had this this dream in the middle of one night that uh, the dream was is. Um, that if I didn't do anything with my epiphanies, that I was going to stop having them. And this is like a nightmare for me. Uh, it, it's just this yeah. revelation. An epiphany. And, it, it was an epiphany right, about epiphanies. Right. And then I, I suddenly realized that I could take these, these epiphanies, these ideas, and I could insert them into a presentation in like 15 minutes and it wouldn't require the rest of my life to build this prototype and and test it out and try to sell it to large corporations and and so that that was a way that i solved that problem at least in my mind so <laughs> well there's there's some there's some there's another benefit to that is you are you know when you put it into a presentation put it out there you you are a great listener you you read the room and right you adjust right. based on that um so you are then being able to do market research. You mm-hmm. put it in there. There's some of them I'm sure that you put in your presentation that you watch people, it rocks them back in their chairs. Yeah. And they go like this, so to speak. Right. And others, they're checking their cell phones. So then you get a chance to get outside confirmation of yeah. that deserves to live. Right, right. And then to your point, and I have a responsibility to make sure it lives. <laughs> I mean, really. Right, right. And so if I... Um, if this, this is an idea that suddenly gets known to 10,000 people, 20,000 or million people, uh, the odds of it living on into perpetuity are far greater. So, um, so I'm, I'm the messenger of sorts. (laughs) Well, that takes us back to, um, uh, um, so I'm I'm living in space to kind of it's a, <laughs> no, weir- I get it. a weird space, but <laughs> right, you're 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 triggering uh, a re- a reminder of VisiCalc. Okay, yeah. Now, f- for those who are watching, there's going to be eighty percent of them that are going. I have no idea what you're talking about. Right, you and right. I know. VisiCalc was an engineer that had an epiphany of what if people could actually see the numbers that are within the chips when it's doing the math. What if they could actually see those numbers yeah. and then adjust them? And it, be, and it was the first spreadsheet. Right. And it came from a moment of aha. Yeah. Well, I gave it a go as a company. Yeah. But thank God for that. You know, yeah. that, that epiphany then was carried forward by Lotus and Excel and changed our world. Right. Absolutely. Um, yeah. yeah. Those that create are not necessarily the ones that, that grow the child. <laughs> <laughs> yeah sometimes you need that person that breaks the ice and yeah that's what Vesicalc was yeah um that was good um all right this has been an absolutely fascinating <laughs> we're, discussion we're a, we, we're a little we uh <laughs> well maybe, we're, it's been wonderful this is wonderful yeah yeah well um we're probably a little self-absorbed in what we're talking <laughs> about <laughs> but uh yeah. yeah so uh this this has been an absolute blast um, uh, do you have any last words you'd like to leave our audience with? Uh, that, that's, that's an, uh, that's an odd thing for me to come up blank with. <laughs> um, but, uh, let's see, I think I would, I would, uh, I think I'd leave with the idea and this is just the other part of the manus, the, the book from the garage to Mars. Okay. We have these intuitive nudges that come to us, epiphanies about maybe I should do that. Maybe I should start a space company or maybe I could actually build something about being a futurist. What a crazy right. idea. Right. And there's two voices in our heads. There's the reasonable one that goes, Tom, good gosh, no. You know, yeah. not, I mean, what are you thinking? And, but then there's that little whisper that goes, but maybe. Yeah. And the other whisper is, yeah, but don't you want to find out if there's something down this path right right and i those things i call nudges yeah and i think there is so much to be said for just saying yes and look around the corner and oh, take yeah. and the rock worst thing that happens you find out yeah i was right there was nothing there yeah but every once in a while i've uh, i've 
decided I'd rather live a no regrets lifestyle. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And I also been wanting to live a no alarm clock lifestyle, but we're always, not, you not and I so are probably successful. away from that one. Yeah. Yeah, like, not, yeah. Not totally successful on that one. Well, Scotty, this has been an absolute is, pleasure. No uh, kidding. <laughs> we, we haven't, see, we, we knew each other from 15 years ago. Right. And uh, had so much fun back then. And we haven't talked in 10 decades. And it's wonderful to reconnect. Right. R- truly. This, is, this has been a blast. Well, I wish you the best moving forward. Yeah. Well, and uh, we will we'll stay in touch here. We'll stay in touch. Absolutely. Thank All you. All right. Thank you. Yeah.